I want to invite you as we are getting into the fourth week of our series of Lamentations. This series has been a difficult series to preach, but it has been one that has expanded my horizons. This week, I want to preach to you from Lamentations 4. Lamentations 4. I'm going to read, as, although we um, don't preach the whole chapter, I felt like since the book of Lamentations was a series of five poems, I wanted to read each of the poems before I start the service. Um, and before I start the sermon, and as I start dissecting it, we'll go back to very specific parts on it. But let me read you Lamentations 4. The holy stone lies scattered. How the gold has grown dim. How the pure gold is changed. The holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold. How they are regarded as earthen pots, the worker of a potter's hands. Even jackals offer of the breast, they nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel, like the ostrich in the wild. The tongue of nursing infants stick to the roof of their mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps for the chastisement of the daughters of my people has been greater than the punishment of Saddam, which was overthrown in a moment and no one hands wrung her free. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now their face is black and set. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. They've become as dirty as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by the lack of the fruits in the field. The hands of compassion women have boiled their own children. They become their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord gave full vent of his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and he kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundation. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world. The foe of our enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who shed in the midst of her blood, the blood of the righteous. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with the blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wonders. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. The Lord himself scattered them. He will guard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed, ever watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near. Our days were numbered, for the end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. They breath of our nostrils, the Lord anointed, was captured in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. But rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam, you who dwell in the land of us. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of Adam, he will uncover for your sins. I want to just spend some time and talk to you about it's not over. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, there is someone today who is reflecting on the personal experiences of their lives, who is dealing with significant challenges. I need you to touch them and let them know it's not over. It's not over. As deep and as dark as it seems, it's not over. As painful and as broken as they seem, it's not over. I ask right now that you will touch the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
so it will be acceptable in your sight. In your holy name, amen. Right now, I want to look at this fourth chapter. It, it, it's very different from the first three chapters of the book of Lamentations. The first chapter uh, was very specific in dealing with the issue of the nation, fall, of, of the city of Jerusalem falling and why. The second chapter dealt with the nation falling and how that happened. Then the third chapter, the greatest that faithfulness chapter that we talked about last week, talks about the pain that Jeremiah felt and how God was it was the tent pole of the book of Lamentations. But now we get to this chapter. Solomon, I have to report, this is the darkest chapter in the entire book of um, Lamentations. This chapter moves from generalities and theological constructs and starts dealing with the depravity of being locked in a city for 180 days as you're on the city by your enemy. Jeremiah in this text after he talks about the faithfulness of God in the last book is now dealing with the reality that they are living 180 days locked in the walls of Jerusalem. They are surrounded by the Babylonians and they are on the siege this is right before they are about to enter into captivity. And these are his words. One of the things I think that is so important in this chapter is that Jeremiah needs you to know that it's not over. That even in the darkest places, God can still work and God is still present and God can still help. I want to give you three things that happen to let people know that it's not over. To let you know that as you deal with situations that seem overwhelming, that it's not over. Let me give you these. Our value doesn't change is the first one. We have to admit our consequences. And the final thing is God is still with us. God is still with us. I want to spend time here uh, in the very beginning of the chapter. In the very beginning of the chapter, it says something very different. It says something very different than what we're used to. It says this at the top of the chapter. It says, how the gold has grown dim. How the pure gold has changed. What I find very interesting about this point in the text, Justin, is that gold cannot um, rust. Gold cannot be corroded. Gold cannot age. The only thing that can happen to gold is if you put dirt over it. Many of us are judging our own personal value on our situations just like Jeremiah is judging his own personal value and the value of the children of Israel and those in Jerusalem by the situation. One of the things I need to let you know right now that no matter what your situation, no matter what the world tells you, no matter who the world says, you and your value does not change. Imagine this. You drop gold into salt water, into salt water. It will corrode over, but all you have to do is take it out and wash it, and it becomes clean. You drop gold into mud, and the mud will crust over, and all you have to do is take out the gold and wash it, and it will become clean. You can leave gold outside, and it will rain, but never rust. What am I trying to say to you right now that there are so many of us, there are so many of us 
that are judging ourselves by our situation and determining our value by what is around us, what's on top of us, what's built into us. And what I'm trying to tell you right now is that I need somebody to understand this morning that your value is not determined by your situation. Jeremiah, in this flourishing language, is trying to speak to the children of Israel in a way that they could best understand that even though that the temple had been sacked, and even though that the high places had been destroyed, and even though that they had been captured and put into captivity, even though they had gone through 180 days of starvation, that they were still the chosen of God. There's somebody right now that is looking at their life, and they see the old the wreck and they see all the ruin and they see all the problems and they're like God is that for me but I'm here to tell you that you're going to come out of this like pure gold don't ever let family or jobs or society or people define who you are because in God's eyes you're like pure gold I never understood why 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 Christians why Christians would let themselves be judged by others and define themselves by how others judge them. You know what's so crazy is as I read this text, there's something else that jumps out to me is that if we don't see our value, we can often miss what God is doing because of our despair because we let the situation define us. Um, in verse 4, it says, it says that the infant stick to the roof of its mouth for thirst. Now, Carl, in this hundred, if you, if you ever go to um, Jerusalem, there is a place called the Cave of David. And it's where they think the old city of David is. And you can go down in the cave and you start climbing down into the catacombs. And if you go down into the catacombs, there is tunnels that there's still water running through that you can, that you can like crawl through that provide water into the city of Jerusalem. Now, the fact is that during the siege, they didn't have food, but they had water. This siege, the Babylonians could not stop their water supply, but they could stop their food. But what is, is interesting to me is that the people in the city got so despairing that they became thirsty, not hungry. They had the resource of water, but now my infants are thirsty. Let me, let me break this down, why this means, that should mean something to you. God could be offering you fresh water in your situation. God could be speaking to you clearly in your situation. But because you don't value yourself or you or you take the analysis from the outside, or you take all the stuff that's put on top of you, that you miss the living water that could speak into your life. How many of us are in situations where we feel hemmed in on every side, attacked from every side, and God is trying to feed us living water into our situation, but we're so busy looking at the exterior elements that we miss what God is doing. How many of us are like the children of Israel where our mouth is so dry that our tongue sticks to the roof of our mouth while there's living water flowing in the city? I believe that so many of us are missing moments of living water even in our most difficult times because we're so busy, just like Jeremiah described in the first part of this text, concerned with the exterior varnishments of something that wasn't going to be changed. 
I need somebody to understand me this morning that right now, right now, you are dealing with difficult situations. Your value doesn't change, and God is interested in bringing you living water into your situation. I need you to get that into your spirit, because as you battle the attack of the devil, as you battle the attack against your spirit, as you deal with the reality of walking around in a broken world, God says your value is set, and I have living water for you. So I need somebody to to take these words and know that God counts you as valuable, and he will continue to support you no matter what. I know. I know, I know, sometimes it's hard to understand our value because you'll have people around you, they will use names and innuendo, you have systems and structures that will marginalize and push, but that's why we have the word of God and he clearly defines your value. The next point is admitting our consequences. It says this further down, this was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. As, as much as I'm preaching lamentations, really, and I'm about the goodness of God, we, at the foundational issue of this, is that the people of Israel followed false prophets and false kings And this was God's retribution against them. In our culture today, I want to encourage every believer to really have a discerning eye about who you follow and what you let in your spirit. This is not a political statement. This is not about right or left. This is theological statement because when you claim to speak from the mouth of God, there is a weight and a pressure on your shoulder. So as you speak from the mouth of God, particularly as a pastor, a priest, a prophet, whatever you want to call yourself, it ought to be in line with God. One of the great things that interests me so much about our modern milieu of American Christianity is that there are those that will be to claim they are speaking for God and they are reinforcing the structures of power. And it's interesting to me that Jesus was a black man um, from from Nazareth that came and he spent more time with the tax collectors, the poor, the sick, the lame, and the broken. And we have so many people in our culture and our society that once they get a clergy cloth and they get a reverend, a pastor, and a bishop behind their name, they're more interested and standing up for the rich, the wealthy, and the rights of those in power. What I will tell you that is blasphemy because you are now preaching against the tenets of what Jesus does. I need to encourage our people as you are watching sermon after sermon, as you do your Sunday at six different churches, make sure that you are watching and listening to those that are preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few tests of how you know if they're preaching the gospel. First of all, how do they care about all human beings? Not just the ones in their audience. I, I, I'm pro-life. I, I'm pro-life. I, 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 I love somebody when they're a baby. I love somebody when, they, um, when they're a toddler. I love them when they're in elementary school. I like them when they are in school, college, or they're senior. I them whether they're black, white, or black or white. I don't care. I don't care if they have um, same-sex marriage or if they have a hetero partner. I don't care what it is. I love them because they are divine creations of God. You know, there's some people that will claim they're pro-life and all they care about is an embryo, but they will watch a black man get shot in the street. And then they'll wonder why, and they won't say a word. They won't ask a question. They won't say anything. How do you care? about life at, 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 at three months, but you can't care about life when I'm 33. There is a problem with that, and we have to be careful that we are not following false prophets. There are so many of us 
that are now following false prophets, that it will cost us consequences in the long run. I need us, particularly as believers, to have a discernment about who and what we follow, about what theology we hold up. Not, pol- not politics, let me be clear on this. The politics is a man and the navigation of power. Theology is the study of God and knowing what God says. It's our theology that should inform our politics, not our politics that inform our theology. We need to make sure our theology is correct. Not every word and phrase that tickles our ears, not everybody that says there's something should lead us because we have to admit the consequences when we start. It says it here. This was for the sins of her prophet, iniquity of her priest. Now, this part is the weirdest part in the entire book of Lamentations. Carl, I, I searching this last segment of chapter four, and I, I just didn't understand it when I read it. It reads like this. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Adam. You dwell in the land of us, but to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer, but your iniquity, O daughter of Adam, he will punish you. He will uncover your sins. First of all, there's a couple uh, I want to talk about. God is still with us. Um, No other place in the book of Lamentations do they mention the the daughters of Adam. And as I was doing my research, I was like, Who's the daughter of Adam? What are the daughters of Adam? Why are they even here? This doesn't make any sense. Why would 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 um why would this be in this book? Why you know I figure um Jeremiah is dealing directly with the children of Israel. So why would he even bring up the Edomites? It doesn't make any sense. He's he doesn't bring up the Babylonians by name. He doesn't talk about the brokenness of the kingdom. He doesn't talk about anybody else by name but the Edomites. And what my research um, has, has, has came, came to show me was that the children of Israel and the children of Adam had been mortal enemies for years. And the kingdom of Adam was right below Judah. And what it is, they were fighting and they had been at each other's throats. But the Edomites decided that they would side with the Babylonians. So when Jerusalem was sacked, The Edomites helped with the burning of Jerusalem. They took the lands from them. But what I realized is that when Jeremiah knew something, it was like God would never let those that would attack us while we are down still have the victory against us. So my last point this morning is that God is still with us because... Because, you know, Jeremiah already had predicted that they would only be in exile for so long. So their fate with the Babylonians had already been worked out. But right now he needs to deal with those that would attack them while they're down and those that would kill them while they're down and those that would rejoice while they're down. And he needed to let people know that even though you took advantage of me while I was broken, even though you took advantage of me while I was being attacked, even though you got a little bit off my back while I was doing that, God is still with us. And one day God will make sure that what you've done to me, he will pay back. So what God has done, what he did right here was that he got the children of Adam for attacking his anointed. My God, I need somebody to understand how powerful that is. Justin, Adam had continuously done evil against the children of Israel. They talked about him, they lied about him, they took advantage of him. They used sources and authorities like the Babylonians to take advantage of him. But this is what God is saying, right? This is what Jeremiah is saying right here. You thought you beat me. You thought you won. But in the end, 
Because I serve a living God that is on my side. Because I serve a living God that is true to his word. Because I serve a living God that is faithful. When the scales are tipped at the end of this situation, no matter how much you plan for my defeat, no matter how much you plan to destroy me, God will still have the last laugh. I know. Somebody's listening to this and be like, um, that doesn't fit my theological perspective of God because God loves everybody. But God said, I have a special covenant with those that are my children, those that have spoken and believe in me, and I'm here to protect and hold them and keep them. And sometimes you've got to know that you don't have to fight every battle yourself because at the end of the day, when you let God fight your battles for you, he will defeat those that thought they had walked over you. There's one thing I'm learning in my later years, um, Solomon, is that sometimes I want to say something, I feel like I should say something. I, I want to react. I want to tell them. But sometimes the best thing for me to do is just stand and let God fight my battles. Because when he starts fighting my battles, shit, things start shifting, things start moving, and he will defeat those that have tried to abuse me. There's somebody here that's listening to the sound of my voice, that you are fighting people that you shouldn't be fighting. That you are planning and scheming and wasting your energy with family members and co-workers and others in your life. And you need to be like Jeremiah said right here. Oh, daughter of Adam, he will punish and he will uncover. What God does is fight your battles for you. Don't fight these battles. Let God fight them. Because even in the darkest places, he can still work. I want to pray for somebody today. You're dealing with You don't understand your value. You might be heading along the wrong way, listening to the wrong people, and you're trying to fight the wrong fights. I'm here to tell you, you're valuable to God. You need to listen to his word, and you need to let him fight your battles. I'm going to relieve you of a ton of stress today. Don't fight battles that you aren't built to fight. Don't fight battles that you aren't designed to fight. Trust God to fight your battles. Let's pray. Father God, there's somebody under the sound of my voice that this morning is struggling right now. They don't understand their values. They've been listening to a lot of the wrong sources and a lot of wrong information and they're fighting the wrong battles. God, I have a threefold prayer. God, may you touch them and let them know that the exterior is not their value, that you have created them as a divine creation in you, that they are beautifully and wonderfully made. They are like pure gold. Let them not be designed by what the world and the outside has put on them, but let them see themselves inside. God, I pray they have discernment not to listen to false prophets, not to listen to those that would define things in ways that are destructive to the faith and to the belief in you, God. And God, let them put down the knife and the sword let them know the battles they need to fight and the battles they don't need to fight. Let them know the ones they will defeat and the ones that you'll defeat. God, let them have nights filled with peace because they don't have to fight the fight anymore. God, give them the discernment to know what to fight and what not to fight. In your holy name, amen.